Men have needs. You should expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. Coach Kristen, welcome back. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello, beautiful. You look amazing. Your background is amazing. Thank you. I, I definitely perked it up, stepping up my game today because you always look fabulous. You always have a great background. I'm, I'm trying to, I don't know. I also move around in my chair a lot. So I changed my chair. So I'll sit still, but thank you. Listen, I appreciate the indication of infection. It is what I'm here for because listen, this is how we're going to help each other change, right? We inspire each other. Um, I look up to you. You look up to me. We change our behaviors because we surround ourselves with amazing people who only help us grow and evolve and be so much brighter and shinier. I'm super glad that you're here, my love. So the reason why we're having this conversation today, for those of you who are maybe catching up, who are new, Coach Chris and I are old TikTok friends. We have been doing uh, a few podcasts here and there when the temptation strikes, when we have a hot topic that we want to touch on, we bring it to you. I love bringing Kristen here because she's so concise, so intelligent, so well-spoken, so well-informed. And the reason why we're talking today is because we have a phenomenon that's happening right now that a lot of people are aware of, which is cheating because Mr. Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters stepped out on his marriage and had a baby outside of his marriage. Yes, with Dave Grohl coming out as having stepped out on his wife and making that very public statement saying he's trying to repair things. There's definitely been some people who have reacted with shock and others who are saying the signs were there all along, but disappointing nonetheless for many fans. Disappointing for many fans because I think a lot of us had the idea that this was one of the good ones. This was a good guy. It was a marriage that was over 20 years old. From what I understand, he has four children. He comes across, I think, in interviews as somebody who is warm and kind and caring. So yes, very disappointing. And what brought me into this conversation with you today was a TikTok where somebody said, after 20 years, men get bored. Right. That's a common one. And so, of course, I took that opportunity to respond to that fellow because I think that is, there's a lot of justifications. I think that a lot of people are making, not just for Dave Grohl, but for specifically for men who cheat. I, I want to frame this around, there's different uh, schools of thought for a lot of people out there when it's a man cheating versus it's a woman cheating. But mm -hmm. the thing that came up was boredom. Or yeah. if she wasn't, doing her wifely duties. We won't say the terms that some of those men were using. If she's um, not satisfying me, I'm going to go get somewhere else. Men have needs. Men have needs. You should expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors for people's marriages, right? But the fact that he issued the very public statement saying he's trying to repair things lets me say maybe, maybe things weren't open. Maybe things weren't consensually non-monogamous. But to your point about that TikTok that he said men get bored, actually in heterosexual relationships, it is the wife that gets bored first, study show. And typically they are bored after one year of marriage. Mm -hmm. Not to say that men don't get bored as well. They just don't get bored as quickly as their wives. And when they do get bored, it's usually around year three to four. Okay. So Let's come back to the women here for a second. Mm -hmm. And I want to do all the stats that you did in that TikTok because it was brilliant. Thank you. I make sure I had them on hand here. I appreciate you doing that, by the way, because I want all of that information right here. But you piqued my curiosity. What is it that women get bored of after a year? So a lot of the report that it's about the monotony, they're also starting to find that maybe some of them did not cohabitate. Maybe some of them did, but they're starting to find that they're taking on a lot more of the labor. We talk about mental load, invisible labor is a hot topic online right now as well. And when they're not getting great sex, when they're not getting good orgasms, and then they're having to take on responsibilities to kind of care for or tend to their husband's life, whether that's doing more of his laundry, again, more about being outside of agreements about how you split work. When relationships are less egalitarian, there is less sex. So there's a few factors that I think go into it for women when they start checking out from their sex life. For me, the point you're making is work mm -hmm. ethic. Yes. If he doesn't have a strong work ethic outside of the bedroom, 
he's not likely to have a strong work ethic inside the bedroom. And this is why I say use a no kissing for three months dating rule and do that full examination. Because part of what I bring in my life is work ethic. And yeah. you will see that in the bedroom as well, even though now I'm a pillow princess. <laughs> but that's another story. But here's- To the each their own. To yeah, each their own. Beginning, what I observed in my husband is he works from morning until late at night. He works responsibly. He's responsible with his finances. Mm -hmm. When he does something, whether it's cleaning his car, whether it's trimming the hedges around his house, whether it's doing a job, and, and believe me, my husband is one of the best when it comes to his industry. Mm -hmm. He does so conscientiously. So you have work ethic, you have conscientiousness. My husband yes. got to know me before we started our relationship, which means a desire to communicate and understand. Yes. Our concepts that will translate into the bedroom. When you tell him what you like, he'll work mm -hmm. at it until he gets it. Yes. But you have to have somebody who wants to understand your wants, needs, and desires. The Gottman Institute is one of my favorite places out there that does research about relationship longevity. And they did find some key behaviors that indicate you're likely to have a pretty good sex life if you do these things. And one of them was knowing one another's erotic turn-ons and turn-offs. To know what turns your partner on or off, you have to pay attention. You have to ask questions. You have to be vulnerable and be willing to communicate what you like. So there's there's a lot wrapped up in that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, when they're new in marriage, they've relied upon that new relationship energy to make things really hot and heavy and sizzle in the bedroom. And it is. Right? That's <laughs> great. But once the new relationship energy wears off, that's where communication, curiosity, seek to understand what really sparks desire in this person. What gets their fire going? What yeah. makes them feel all warm and juicy? There's a pressure. You say warm and juicy, keep the spark, keep the desire going. And I am in a place in my relationship where we have sex on Saturday afternoon and we do it the same way, pretty much the same time of day. Mm -hmm. talk about routine yes no routine. but I mean, I mean i'm just saying talk routine is great routine. though routine is wonderful but yes. there's pressure i could look at the way we do it even though it is satisfactory and i listen it's, it's satisfactory to me i'm 52 years old i'm not dragging my husband to swingers clubs anymore we're not doing it three times a day anymore mm -hmm. i'm not putting strippers home for us anymore all of that for, I'm not even bisexual anymore. That's how much my sexuality has changed over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine with the once a week in the same way for the mm -hmm. same amount of time. And sometimes Kristen, I'm like, baby, let's just do a quick and easy. Cause I'm not even in the mood for an orgasm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if well, I want to finish this thought, if I was looking at society, and what it says I should be doing, I might feel unsatisfied not because i'm unsatisfied but because of what i'm hearing outside of a relationship that's saying it should be different i've mm -hmm. asked my husband by the way are you okay with this the way it is and he's like absolutely perfectly fine as i was saying to each their own right that you're actually doing it the magic number of times there has been a study out there looking at how many times per year couples should be doing and having i shouldn't say doing it having sex. Um, how many times they should be having sex? And once per week was sort of the magic number because it, anything less than that, there was some strife, more strife reported in the relationship. But when there was more than that, there wasn't necessarily an increased level of happiness within the relationship. So that's one factor. Also, I am a big fan of scheduling sex. Scheduling sex was actually probably what you were doing when you were first dating your partner. You just called it date. But, you know, at a certain point, once you were intimate, you probably knew when you saw each other, there was going to be sex, but you didn't see each other every day at first, right? You weren't living together. There weren't as many overnights, things like that. So people actually get out of the habit of scheduling sex and then wonder why they have less sex. So you're, you're doing the smart thing there too with scheduling. You're doing the smart thing too with checking in. You're not just making assumptions that everything is fine. Because as you say, when we are growing, aging, changing, we've got to check in with ourselves and with our partners. So 
regardless of what, again, outside messages might say, you're doing all of the fundamentals. There's not ever just one key factor in having a nice, spicy, and connected sex life. It's multifaceted. And it's going to look a little different for everybody. Yeah, you're right. Some people might go like every weekend, same position, and you just lay there and don't even get an orgasm all the time. Because again, one thing I addressed in that video was the orgasm gap. Maybe a, a gap in who's getting theirs could lead to um, women getting bored with sex. But again, you know yourself. You know your body. You know your desire. And all that matters is that you two are happy because you two get to write the rules of your own relationship. Thank you for that. Like, let's let's have permission for doing it our way instead of society saying, if it's not twice a week, there's something wrong with you. Correct. Yeah. There's no magic number. I get asked that a lot. How many times should we be having sex? And I always point to that study. Less than once a week. And even expand your definition of sex. Mm. As you say, if, if sex has to be about penis and vagina intercourse, if you're heterosexual, if it has to be about both of you getting an orgasm and you're not meeting those things, then you could view your time together as not having sex, not being intimate. So then you get down the road and you're like, we haven't really been intimate lately. But you weren't thinking about the kissing, the naked times in the shower, the cuddling and fondling each other, the time that only one of you had an orgasm, the time that you two just had a, a quick oral session. Expand your definition of what sex looks like too. And and for me, a part of it too, is just the times when I look at my husband and I'm like, stop it, you're too sexy right now. Just, just looking at him in like an admiration for mm -hmm. his physique and his, his, as some people have described when they use the no more assholes methodology, the no kissing for three months and they end up with somebody. And I've heard more than one person say this. He is the manliest of men in the most gentle of ways. I and it's, oh, I oh, and I just, I look at this man, just, we make out again, intimacy, right? You made that point that we can expand the, the idea of sexuality into intimacy. And so mm -hmm. we call it the bedroom intimacy. And I call the ways that I look at him sometimes intimacy. And I also have minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each to ensure there's physical intimacy every single day that creates those chemicals from the contact. So yeah. minimum five seconds gets the juices going, oxytocin, serotonin from the kiss chemicals, amphetamine, aphrodisiac, anti depressant and so when I kiss him and I press my body against his and I grab his butt in my hand for me that's just as effective yes absolutely you brought it all home there that it's all the things it's not just one thing it's not just the kiss it's the closeness it's their smell it's the whole package it's this now you got me thinking about hugging and kissing on my husband and grabbing his butt he has the best butt well, is he there right now? I say, go do it. He's downstairs. <laughs> uh, we did. We both work from home. So I get the, the joy and pleasure of getting to kiss him many, many times during the day and spank that ass. Ah, spank that ass. I love it. <laughs> Let's swing back into those stats. Yes. The first stat that we talked about is how it's not men that get bored faster. Typically, it's the woman who gets bored faster. What else should mm -hmm. we do? Well, even when women do get bored, they cheat at lower rates. Is it um, significantly lower or is it slightly lower? It's slightly lower. The stats that I found is that one quarter of men, about 23% of men uh, say that they have cheated during their current relationship, whereas 19.2% of women report the same. Now, there's also some numbers out there, though, that show that 20% of males and 30% of females confess to having cheated on their spouse at some point in their relationship, but we often define cheating as different things. Right. For so. example, I may have never been physical with somebody, but if I had a crush and I hung out with them, yeah. I might consider that cheating. Yes. Uh, whereas men often don't consider it to be cheating unless there is penis and vagina intercourse. That leaves a lot of acts that can be committed <laughs> without it being labeled cheating. Yeah. It wasn't it well, funny people. I remember Leslie Mann's character. She's like, I didn't cheat. He just went down on me. Right. Well, you cheated. You had intent there to, to be physically intimate with another person when the agreement was not there between you and your spouse to allow that to happen. 
I think bottom line is if it would be considered a sexual act, either theoretically or scientifically, there it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I definitely don't get into like the, the biblical um, thing where it's, if you have lust in your heart, you've cheated. And yet many women do, we are the ones who basically defined an emotional affair. Right. right. And many men don't even acknowledge emotional affairs as being an affair, even though the lifetime stats might be different. 20% for males, 30% for females. It's often a less physical based relationship when women cheat. Right. I think that a big part that's contributing right now, especially to cheating is, is the lack of transparency in how we really feel. I brought up the orgasm gap. There's a 30% difference in, in orgasms uh, between heterosexual men and their last sexual experience versus heterosexual women. 95% like of men orgasmed, whereas only 65% orgasmed. Again, if you are fine in having a difference and one of you has orgasms more consistently, cool. But where it's a problem is when it's not spoken about. When it's not brought up of like, hey, you're when you're done, you're done and you leave me hanging. Or you've outlawed sex toys because you think I should be able to come in a certain way and I'm not. It's another conversation that's been going on in the background for me on my social media right now is watching pornography and how people feel about that. Yes. And it's not In my opinion, it's okay to tell somebody whether or not they can, which I, I say it's the same thing as, as a man saying to him, you're not allowed to use a dildo or a vibrator. I don't think we should be exercising control over other people. We should be having discussions before starting yes. a committed relationship and choosing the person that is right for us and our goals and values without needing to change their behaviors. Absolutely. And for both of those things, I don't think that it's necessarily good or bad either way to say whether you do or don't want those things in your relationship, again, to each their own, but it's more about the motivation, yeah. right? If somebody turns to porn rather than turning towards their partner, then it's a source of disconnection, right? Yeah, like right, exactly. But maybe someone watches it because they have a lack of sex education. So they've paid for uh, a site like Erica Lust Films, which is um, ethical porn. It's also shot for the female gaze. Maybe that person who was prevented from having sex education now feels more confident in going in the other room and going down on their partner and doing it well. Maybe they want to watch some Owen Gray and pull some tips from him. He's one of the hottest adult film stars out there. So there's more reasons than just getting off that people might watch porn, but also there's nothing wrong with people choosing to mm -hmm. just get off with porn. Same with sex toys. The vulva, vulva owners typically only orgasm from penetrative sex when there is clitoral stimulation. Some of us get that from the position we're in or how our bodies are naturally built. Some of us have a clitoris that's a little closer to our vaginal opening. Some of us, it's a little further away. Hands or sex toys mm -hmm. are the only way that we're typically going to come. Yeah. Um, a penis going in and out is, is not it. So the sex toys, if someone's turning to them and it's becoming a distraction and it's a point of disconnection for you and your partner, same as porn, that's when it's an issue. We should view sex toys as tools. Not everybody needs to use those tools, but just like we might have both a screwdriver and a drill at home, both those things will do the same job. One will do them a little faster and hurt your wrist a little bit less, but see it as a tool. Porn can be the same way. It's not for everybody, but yeah, it's all about how you're using those tools. That is true. And nobody should ever be controlling you. Absolutely not. Have have those conversations. Be be open. Be vulnerable. Ask questions without making judgments. A lot of us pull our judgment and our context because all of us are our context, our upbringing, the messages that we have gotten from society, friends, family. So understand that your context may be telling you specific messages. And maybe you need to ask yourself, what do I really think now? Now that I'm a fully fledged adult I'm learning more about my my sexual desires. What do I really think about this thing? Right. I want to take a second, just whenever I hear the word vulnerable, I feel compelled to add my own little thing to that. And then I want to get back into the stats that you were talking about in that TikTok. Whenever we feel the word vulnerability, 
I want us to understand that what it means is to tell the truth, even if you're afraid of the outcome of telling the truth. So, so honest, honesty at whatever expense, basically. What else did you tell that guy in that TikTok who said that, oh, men will cheat because they get bored after 20 years? Let's see. Oh, there was one other thing. A lot of men tend to turn to things like sex addiction when, you know, times like this, they get caught with their pants down. They get caught with a love child or a mistress. They often say, oh, it's my sex addiction. And I'm not trying to belittle people who actually have a sex addiction because there are people out there who do have true, genuine addiction and they, they fall underneath the addiction model. They are ruining their lives, their finances, their jobs. Their life is basically falling apart because of their compulsion to do something. That is different from bad behavior. Now, men have an increased tendency to engage in what they call regretful sexual behavior when they're experiencing a negative affective state, they have a death in the family, they lose their best friend, they lose a job, things like that. They have something bad and very impactful happen in their lives. They act badly. That's not to say it's an excuse. I yeah. got some causation correlation questions in there, right? But poor impulse control is not the same as addiction. Yeah. You having a bad time in life, going through something really, really hard is not an excuse to go out and act badly. Again, all we see is we know that the studies show that men are more likely to participate in poor behavior when they have something happen to them. That doesn't mean that it's they've had it happen and they will act badly. It's not an excuse. We're just saying that this often happens. Studies show this happens when they have something big in their life. So all I say is I caution people to throw out basically a diagnosis. You can't give a diagnosis of that guy has a sex addiction. He's been a cheater all along. He's a sex addict. No, he has poor impulse control and there's a difference. And poor coping mechanisms. Yes. So my husband has healthy coping mechanisms. If he feels an overabundance of stress, anxiety, he jumps into a hyperbaric chamber oh. and he reduces inflammation in his brain, which is stress and anxiety, depression. He reduces the inflammation in his body, which alleviates his mental health. He has good coping mechanisms. Some people will use other people instead of drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism. And I first learned about this when I read uh, the books by Harriet Lerner. Oh, yes. And she wrote The Dance of Anger, etc. And it opened my eyes to how sometimes people use other people in dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And the example that she gave was somebody who once a year went into a self-sabotaging mode. Mm -hmm. And through therapy discovered that at that time of year, many years ago, something very traumatic had happened. And so when that time of year swung back again, they went into a dysfunction mm -hmm. and then just a poor coping mechanism that was destructive to their relationship. Interesting. I'm a, I'm a fan of Harriet Lerner. She actually is, lives in Lawrence, Kansas, not far from me. In spite um, of my writing style. You put it very succinctly there that um, the coping mechanism, the way that we deal with this stress, something something's amiss for some people. And not to say it's all men, and I'm not going to not all men either. But again, what we see is they're either not given the tools and strategies to understand that this is not okay. How do you actually deal with stress, with trauma, with sadness? I'm so glad that your husband has found those healthy coping mechanisms. I brag on my husband as well. I feel like he has too. You know, th through all this, a lot of, again, comments were saying he lost his drummer, Taylor. I guess he lost his mother as well. Some, some people were using that as his justification. As, you know, my husband lost his brother a few years ago. And I never at one moment thought that he would go off and do something damaging, self-destructive, nothing to, you know, implode our relationship or anything like that. He was sad. He was grieving, but he also is a fully fledged adult. <laughs> He's on level four of cognitive development, he has empathy, he has understanding, and he understood that there was going to be work to be done, but that was not going to involve drugs, alcohol, or using other people, right? He didn't just dive into 
a new friendship or, you know, surround himself suddenly with his friend group. He, he had time with his friends. He had time with me. He had time with family, but he ultimately realized that this was something for him to work through and not to use other things and other people to cover it up. He had a process. I think it's important that we take the time to witness people in multiple situations before really deeming them as trustworthy. And I think things yes. we need to look for is do they practice emotional regulation and do they take responsibility for themselves and the outcomes of their own behaviors? Or do they blame other people for whatever happens in their life? Even if, you know, like it's your fault, you didn't remind me to change the oil in the car and that's why the engine seized up kind mm -hmm. of. You didn't tell me to. Right. So those were two, right? The lack of emotional regulation and a lack of accountability and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's other things we should watch out for that would be red flags that would indicate probably down the road, they're going to do something that's going to be a betrayal? I think lack of community, okay. um, whether that's a friend group or family or things like that. Now, that's, some people come from very challenging home situations. Family of origin stuff can be complicated. So I'm not saying if he doesn't have a good relationship with his mother, that's a red flag. It's if he does not have someone around him that's been there long term, I, I do see that as a red flag. If, if people have not wanted to keep in contact with you long term and maintain a relationship, regardless of moves or whatever, like the internet and social media is so prolific, we have ways to keep up with people. But if they don't have somebody they can call when they have a question or they're having a tough day besides you. If yeah. you are becoming their entire world, you're looking around and going, wait, where's, where's your friend group? Where is your community? Where are your hobbies? Then that person making you their entire world might seem kind of romantic in some ways. But also that means if you are going to be everything to that person over time, that's absolutely going to kill your desire and your intimate connection. We cannot, as Esther Perel has pointed out in Meeting in Captivity, we just cannot serve as lover, confidant, therapist, you know, neighbor that's going to help out with uh, a project. We all need a group of people around us. So if he has no community whatsoever, I do see that as why hasn't anyone wanted to have you in their community? Why don't people include you? Perhaps that person needs a little more therapy. Perhaps that person is a danger. And if they don't have your attention when they want attention, they'll go seek it from someone else. Yeah, because if you're all they have, then they're going to find something some way. It's either going to, they will either start becoming more controlling of you and your time and make sure you have no one else to pay attention to besides them. Or they are going to, as you say, go find that somewhere else. And this is why part of the no kissing for three months dating rule is meeting people that are important to them. And if they don't have any, drop them. I wish I had that advice before my second husband. Uh, well, hindsight is twenty twenty, my love. Yes, but it was my, an important lesson to learn. My foresight in this relationship after eight years is very rosy. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to teach us today? No, I thank you so much for having me on to have this conversation. I, Dave Grohl is not the first nor the last famous person that's going to have this come up. And I think this comes up each time. These kinds of this commentary, either blaming, you know, the spouse that stayed at home to raise the family or the one that did not stray. People like to make up a lot of stories to just defend famous people and I guess I go more into the like curiosity mode of like, why don't we just start asking some, some questions? Why don't we start trying to understand this from like an emotional relational uh, capacity rather than just making excuses for people. So I, I don't know. I just hope that today's conversation leads people to start asking some questions. If you, if you have an assumption about how people work, maybe just Google that your search engine can produce all sorts of information about relationship dynamics. There's a lot of information out there. Like you say with uh, Harriet Lerner and the Dance of Anger, the Gottman Institute has a lot of information about relationship issues. And Canada's um, best dating coach. Yes. And she, all of your books, so many books on so many topics, clearly. She is a plethora of knowledge. So just educate yourself, inform yourself, and 
you you might come away having an even better and even stronger relationship either with yourself or with the person that you're with. Knowledge is power, my friends. Kristen, where can people find you? Thank you for asking. Uh, my website is openthedoorscoaching.com. I'm most active these days on TikTok, which is Coach Kristen. Uh, Instagram. K. Yes, with a K. K-R-I-S-T-E-N. And Instagram, I just actually switched over to Coach underscore Kristen underscore. Um, Facebook is Open the Doors Coaching. Awesome. Thank you, my love. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on again. Have an amazing day, lovely. You too. Me too.